in the early days of the Civil War, a preacher from New York came to the White House to visit with Abraham Lincoln. It was a lot easier to get an audience with the president back in those days. And when he met with the president, he said, I've not come to ask you any favors. Uh, I've only come to tell you that the, that the people of the North are giving you all that we have. We're giving you the lives of our, of our sons as well as our confidence and our prayers. And I want you to know, Mr. Lincoln, that none of us ever kneel in prayer with these days without asking God to give you the strength and wisdom that you need. And Lincoln broke into tears, and he said, without those prayers, I would have faltered and perhaps failed long ago. So tell everyone you know to keep on praying, and I'll keep on fighting, for I know that God is with us. I think it's both encouraging and comforting as we go through life to know that there are other people praying for us each day. Last week, I had several people tell me that, you know, they were just so grateful. I was at the hospital one day, and the guy said, I'm just so grateful for all the people that have been praying for me. And it's even more encouraging, I think, when we know the content of their prayers. James reminds us that the earnest prayers of a faithful person, a righteous person, has great power and produces wonderful results. So it's really an encouragement to know that other people are praying for us. And in John 17, Jesus prayed for all those who would believe in him through the words of the apostles. And that would be all of us, because that's how we came to believe, through the words of the apostles in the Scripture. And so Jesus himself prayed for us in John 17. And I like to read that every once in a while. And, and today we want to take a look at a passage in Ephesians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul prays for us, for those who believe. If you'd open your Bibles to Ephesians 1, take out that yellow insert from your bulletin. Uh, you can follow along, take some notes as God speaks to your heart. You can open a, a U version and, and uh, get it as well. Uh, directions are on the back of the bulletin. But he, Paul has opened Ephesians with an amazing uh, scripture. In, in verses 13 to 14 is one single sentence in the Greek language. He just goes from, from one thing to another, talking about all the blessings that are ours in Christ. He's so excited, he never even comes up for air. He just enumerates them one by one, over and over again. And, and that's kind of what I was talking about last week. We need to understand what God has given us, what we have in Christ Jesus. And then here, after he's enumerated all those blessings, he prays that we'll realize what we have in Christ, that we'll understand it. Because Paul knows that just teaching the truth isn't enough, that he has to pray for his students. He has to pray that the teaching will grip them, that it will be meaningful to them, that it will be beneficial to them. And it's a good thing for teachers to learn because prayer for their students is so important. In fact, I don't think you have any right to teach or any right to correct another person unless you're laboring in prayer over those people, unless you really care about them. Now, he gives the occasion of prayer in verse 15. He says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I've not stopped praying for you. The two reasons, he says, I'm praying for you. Number one is, for this reason, looks back to what he's just said in verses 13 and 14. They were fellow believers. They were sealed with the very same Holy Spirit as he was. They were committed to the same Lord. A lot of times, I think, our prayers today have to be prompted by something wrong. You know, somebody is sick, or somebody's having problems with their family, or somebody's having marital issues, or something like that. But Paul prays for people simply because they're his brothers and sisters in Christ. They're fellow travelers on this same journey in this same struggle. And the second thing is he had heard about their faith and their love. He had heard about their commitment to Jesus, their service to his people. And this, this is the same thing he said about the Thessalonians, that their faith and their love had gone forth and was manifest to all their fellow Christians. That was the reputation that had spread even to Rome about the Ephesian Christians. I wonder what our reputation is. I wonder what people do. What people what people think of us, when, you know, when they think of us, what, what is it they think? What, what have they heard? What's our reputation? Is our life lived in such a way that those who know and observe us talk about our faith and our love and our service for Christ? Or do they talk about our, our hypocrisy or our disobedience? You know, people are going to talk 
about other people that they know. And I think that it's, it's, it'd be interesting to know, what is our reputation? Well, the reputation of the Ephesians was their faith and their love and their service. But, you know, faith, faith in God and love for the saints go hand in hand. They're, they're the mark of any growing Christian. You know what a saint is. I, I know that I probably should explain what a saint is. That the Greek word means a holy person, one of God's children. It's used for every Christian. Every Christian is a saint. I know that, you know, some of us were taught when we were little that there were certain people that were put on pedestals and they're the saints, but that's not what the Bible indicates at all. The Bible says that every believer is a saint. And there can be no faith in Christ without love for the saints. We actually show our faith in Him, the Bible says, by our relationship to one another. And I believe a lot of people fool themselves here. For they take the love love for Christ to be a feeling, and since they feel warm and fuzzy and good about Jesus, and they like to think about Him, they assume that they love Him. But the Scripture is very clear. Jesus said that our love for God is seen in practical service to other people. In fact, the Apostle John said, we cannot love Him whom we have not seen unless we love those around us whom we have seen. One thing is very important to note. Paul thanks God because they showed love for all God's people. Not just for some. You know, haven't you found in your life that there are some people who are easy to love? I mean, the people that love you are usually easy to love. People that are joyful and positive. People who are happy those are people that are easy to love. And other people you run into are, are very difficult to love. Years ago, one lady was leaving the church. <laughs> you said to love your neighbor, Pastor. You ain't seen my neighbor. <laughs> I'll never forget that. But we're, we're not to pick and choose whom we love. Biblical love is just like God. It's not a respecter of persons. We're to love, we're to love those who are negative, those who are unhappy, those who are joyless, those who are unlovely, those who are different. Paul says we're to love everyone, the Bible says. And he gives us an indication of how we can do that when he speaks about the frequency of prayer in verse 16. He says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul was the kind of man that took pleasure in bestowing sincere praise on his brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I don't mean just flattery. I mean sincere gratitude. I, I, today, it seems to me, in, in, just in the church in general in the United States, there's far too much criticism, far too, far too little thanksgiving in the body of Christ. We have a tendency, and maybe it's because of what we watch on the news, you know? We have a tendency, I think, to, to uh, dwell on the, on the negative rather than on the positive, you know? Uh, we, we, we look at the we, we tend to look at things critically. You know, we hear that all the time on the news, how people look at things so critically. And I believe we have a far healthier faith and a better relationship with our fellow believers if we focus not on the negative, but focused on the positive. And if we began to look at each other and see, what can I praise about that person? What can I give thanks to God about that person? Because I've found in my life, it's very hard to dislike those that you sincerely pray for. So when I've found somebody in my life that I have a rough time liking or loving, I just spend more time in prayer for that person. And, and, and your feelings come around. Now, Paul was quite an intercessor. I mean, at the beginning, if you go back and look at almost every single one of his letters, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, on down the line, he almost always opens with prayer. He talks about how I've been praying for my readers. I've been praying for you, the church. And, and He was very consistent in these prayers. It says he never stopped. He did not cease praying for them. So intercessory prayer is a very helpful thing. We need to pray for one another. Not just when people are having problems, but just as fellow journeyers in, uh, in, in in this life. In fact, we're commanded in the Bible to pray for one another in the book of James. And so we need to be Just spend some time, make a commitment to spend some time this week praying for those you see, those you run into, those you happen to 
uh, happen to come across in your life. But it's not only whether we pray and, and how often we pray that's important, but the content of prayer I think is very important too. A lot of times our prayers are so general. I, I enjoy it when somebody tells me, and I like it, you know, I'm praying for you, but I really like it when they tell me what they're praying for me about. Because then I really know that they're, they're sincere. They're, they're, you know, and sometimes then I'll share with them some specific things. Take a look at the specific nature of prayer that Paul has here. You know, he, he doesn't just say, Lord, Lord, just bless the socks off all these folks. You know, it's not generic like that. It, it's very specific in his requests. Uh, he opens somewhat generally as he prays for their spiritual growth, but even in that general prayer for their spiritual growth, he's specific. Look at verses 17 and 18. I keep asking, so he keeps on doing it, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, you know, we can't grow in our relationship with anybody unless we know them. You know, you, 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 you have to grow in your knowledge of somebody before you're going to grow in a relationship with them. And so Paul prays that God would grant them a disposition of wisdom and knowledge of Christ. Uh, a, a disposition of wisdom and revelation in knowing Jesus. And I don't think he's asking for direct revelation because they already had the revelation of the apostles. You know, the same revelation that we've got. I think he's asking that they would have a spirit that would be open and responsive and receptive to the revelation that God had made through his apostles. That as they read God's word, that he would open their hearts and he would enlighten their minds. For these early Christians who had so recently emerged from a culture of pagan, paganism and fear and superstition and immorality, and, and they were only able to communicate with Paul by letter or maybe occasionally by a messenger, and those letters didn't go very fast. And they were living in the midst of this same heathen environment they had come out of. A spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding was doubly needed as they poured their hearts and their minds over this word that they had been given. So that they could gain a clear insight, not only into the way of salvation, but also to know what was the right course to follow in any given situation. You know, they didn't have hundreds and hundreds of years of Christian tradition and Christian teaching like we do behind us. This was all brand new to them. And, and they needed that wisdom that God had made. Wisdom is simply the ability to apply knowledge. Through the Bible, God revealed his will to us. And we need to pray for wisdom to be able to understand and apply the revelation in a way that pleases him. I never open that book until, except I say, Lord, uh, open my eyes to behold wondrous things. Uh, help me to see, help me to understand as I open your word today. Paul's opening phrase, I think, in verse 18 pretty well sums up what he means when he asks for a, a spirit of wisdom and understanding for us, a revelation, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. He's speaking of our inner vision, our spiritual vision. You know, the heart is the seat of our emotions, uh, of our will, and of our intellect. The Bible talks about we, th we think with our heart, that we we, we, we act with our heart, it's, our, it's part of our will, that we feel with our heart. So the prayer is that we'll be completely open to all that God has to offer us, that we'll just never shut our minds to his will and to his purpose for us. You know, Jesus said a very important thing in John seven seventeen: whoever wishes to do his will shall know of the teaching. You know, we just don't understand things if we don't have a desire to know him and his will and his desire for us. In verses 18 to 23 then, Paul gets very specific, three specific requests, three things that Paul prays that we'll know due to this enlightenment. First of all, he says, I pray that you will know the hope of his calling. Verse 18, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Hope is so important in the teachings of Paul. He calls it the anchor of our souls. 
Paul knows that the best way to drive away the old sinful tendencies of our life is not to concentrate on them and saying no to them as much as it is to concentrate on the blessings of salvation, of who we are in Christ and what Jesus has given us. And that's what he was doing in, those, in, in, verses, in verses 3 to 14 there, before these verses. See, the Christian hope is twofold. We have the hope of glory here on this earth as we are transformed into the image of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. The hope of being like him. The Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's having that glory restored that was lost by Adam and Eve at the fall of man. So we have that hope of glory in this life, of becoming like Christ, of being transformed from one degree of glory to another. But we also have the hope of glory of being with him in glory forever hereafter when we dwell with him in glory and that hope both of those hopes ought to really get us excited that God is not finished with us yet that he's continuing to work in our lives and in our circumstances even now to accomplish all that we hope for all that he's promised us and it's it's amazing to me each year as I grow in Christ how much more fulfillment and meaning and satisfaction I find in him in this life and how much more I look forward to that life to come. God is working in us. It's this hope of his calling. And that calling is to be like Christ in this life and to be with Christ forever in the life to come. And that enables us to be victorious over the trials here, over the temptations that we face here. We talked about that last week. It's, it's readily seen in Paul's life. To the Romans, he says, in, in hope we have been saved. For I consider that the sufferings of this present life are not even worthy to be considered or compared to the glory that's revealed to us. You know, he says, we don't lose heart in this life. Because even though our outer man is decaying, our inner man, that inner vision that he's talking about, is being renewed day by day for the momentary light afflictions that we, you know, we face in this body is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, for we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. The things that are seen, remember I said last week, they're temporal. They don't last. The things that are unseen are eternal. Paul learned how to see beyond the things of this world. Now, where did he get that attitude? How had he learned that? Well, he learned it from the great saints of the past. In Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, he talks about Abraham. God had promised Abraham he would give him a great land. He told him, leave your country, I'm going to give you a great land. And you know what? Abraham was content to dwell in tents all of his life. He never got that land. Why? Because he was looking for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. He saw with those inner eyes of faith what God has, was preparing for him, and it kept him moving on in spite of the difficulties. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, same thing. They all died. They, they were promised that land, the promised land, Israel. And yet none of them received that land. They, they, but they kept on because it says they were seeking a better country that is a heavenly one. They saw beyond. Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It says, he, he, rather than being the king of Egypt, he chose to follow God because he saw that being the king of Egypt was just temporal. And so it says he endured as seeing him who is unseen. He saw beyond the transient treasures of this life and he refused to follow God those things. He had had this hope of eternal glory. Jesus talked about him last week. Same thing. On the cross, how did he endure all all those trials on the cross and before the cross? It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. See, these guys were sustained, they were strengthened, they were supported by the hope to which God was calling them. And we need to catch that same kind of vision. Let this hope to which we are called, the hope of being like Christ, the hope of being constantly transformed in His image, and the hope of glory hereafter fill our thoughts so that we fix our eyes on Jesus, we set our hope on Him. Somebody has likened hope to an iceberg. Now you know that an iceberg, 88% of that iceberg is under the water. And what that means, and icebergs are huge. 
So 88% of it, some of those icebergs stick up 1,000 feet, uh, 1,500 feet into the air, and yet that's, that's only 12% of that iceberg. And you know what that means? It means that no matter how strong the wind is that's blowing against it, it's going to go with the current. That wind's not going to have any dif- in, in, make any difference. When our hope is set in Christ, we're stable. That's why Jesus calls it the anchor of our soul. No matter how, how, how severe the storms are, the tempests, the winds that we face, if our hope is anchored in Jesus, then we will go with him against the storms of life. God wants us to know that hope. And so Paul prays that for us. This, his second request is to know that we would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, he spoke briefly about this in those those first verses, verse 11 and 14. He said, we belong to God, that we are his chosen ones. He has chosen us. We are his possession. He claims us as his own special people. He is our father who loves us, cares for us. He's our protector, our provider, our pace setter. He's the one who goes before us. And we, it says, we are his inheritance. Now, just think about that for a moment. What do you, when, do you, when do you think of an inheritance, maybe you've got an inheritance coming to you. You know, when somebody dies, you're going to get an inheritance. And this helps us to see how important the church is to God. Because we are his inheritance, it says. When you think of an inheritance, it's something pleasing. It's something delightful. It's something exciting. That's how God sees the church. He takes pleasure in us. He delights and rejoices in us. You ever thought of this, how proud God is of us at times in the Gospels? You know, when his son Jesus did something that particularly pleased his dad, what did did God do from heaven? That's my boy. That's my son. He cried out from heaven so people heard him. This is my beloved son. That's my boy. And he does the same thing of of us as we live to please and glorify him. How do I know that? Because he did that of Job. Job was one of his children too, just like we are. And he bragged on Job to Satan. You look up in Job chapter 1, I'm always amazed at that. Did you notice my servant Job, he says to Satan, there's no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me. He's careful not to do anything evil. Get a load of my boy, Job. Mature, upright, blameless, nobody like him. You know, it's a great privilege for us to be his, to be a child of the king. I mean, it's an an amazing privilege, and we need to work at trying to understand what what a great and vast privilege that is. But it also impresses us with the responsibility that is ours to so live that we are an inheritance, his inheritance, that truly brings him joy and honor and glory. And that's what Paul prays for, is that we will know the riches of his glorious inheritance, that we will be that inheritance to him as his people and then the third the third request here is that we might know and experience the awesome greatness of his power in us verse 19 he prays that we may know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe these and he's talking about these these this power the these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places now last week i spoke about god's power in fact i spoke of it from this very verse even though that was it was just a reference but i i used this verse last week it is so essential for us to recognize and not only recognize but to appropriate that vast power of Christ in us. It's resurrection power, he says, to raise us from spiritual death to new life in Christ, to raise us from bondage to sin to freedom in Christ, to raise us from despair to hope, from weakness to power, to raise us above our circumstances, above our situations like we talked about last week, to an abundant life of peace and love and joy. The omnipotent power of God. The very power that spoke these worlds into existence. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead. The very power that enabled Paul and Abraham and and the patriarchs to, to live the way they lived. That power, that very same power, is in us through His Spirit. 
And that means, as I said last week, there is no obstacle too great. There's no temptation that's too strong. There's no trial too serious. There's no problem too insurmountable. There's no chasm too deep, no sin too evil. But what God's power in us can deal with. So never say, I'm only human. Because you are not. You are partakers of the divine nature. And the power of God dwells in you. And that means that nothing can hold you back. That nothing can defeat you. That nothing can bring you into bondage. Because as Jesus promised, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. And this power is not only seen in Jesus' resurrection. It's also seen in his ascension. His exaltation. In verse 21, we see that Jesus is far above all. All rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There's no being in heaven or on earth with the exception of Jehovah himself to whom Jesus is not superior. I mean, let any name be named. Whatever it is, Christ is above us. All authority has been given to him and he is alive in us. That's our hope of glory. Not only is God's power seen in the resurrection and the ascension, but in the coronation of Jesus as he enters heaven. Verses 22 and 23, as God put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church. Now look at the rest of this. The church, which is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, God subjected all things to Christ. That means there is nothing that can prevent the realization of our hope. That means there's nothing that's going to keep him from fulfilling the promises that he made to us. That there's nothing that can ultimately harm us as we receive and appropriate his power within us. It's in the church that God wants to manifest and display his power power today and we could spend hours just on those two verses but the main thing Paul wants us to see is that Jesus wants to work this power in us and through us he is the head we are what the body all right that shows the closeness of the relationship we have with him you know my head it's not very pretty but I I wouldn't want to get rid of it Because I'm really attached to it. And it's a good thing I'm attached to it. Because this body could not function without that head. That shows the closeness. That shows the dependence of our relationship with Him. He's the source of our life. He gives direction and influence in everything that we do. Now that's not to say that the body is unimportant or non-essential. Just because the head is supreme, the body... The body needs this head, but the head needs the body as well because the the body is the expression of the head. And he says it this way, the church is the fullness of him. Very similar to a statement Paul made over in Colossians 1.24. Paul says, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ or Christ's afflictions. Now, you read that at first and you shake your head. That sounds a little heretical. What could be lacking in Jesus' sufferings? Jesus, when he died, said, I have completed the work that you gave me to do. And he did. Christ suffered enough to purchase our salvation. He suffered enough to set us free from sin. He he, he suffered enough to give us new life. But you know what? His body, the church, has to suffer. There's additional suffering on the part of the church in making known that salvation to people. Jesus' sacrifice was enough to purchase our salvation. Our sacrifice of time and money, our sacrifice of service, ministry, of thanksgiving and praise, is necessary to take that gospel, to take that message to the world around us. The church is the fullness 
or the completeness of Jesus as we carry out the direction of the head. We complete him by being his arms and his feet and his body in this world. God dwells in us today, Christ in us, to accomplish through the church what he began when he dwelt in Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. We, the church of Christ, are the continuing incarnation of God in this world. What a high honor this is. Apart from us, the Son of God reckons himself in some measure incomplete. Now that ought to be a great encouragement to us to know that he wishes to be regarded as complete only in connection with his body, with us. This does not in any degree, any manner, detract from the absolute majesty or self-sufficiency of Jesus. As to his divine essence, Jesus is no sense dependent upon or capable of being completed by anything else other than himself. But just as a bridegroom is not complete without the bride, and he is our bridegroom, just as a vine is not thought of as complete without the branches, and we are the branches of that vine, just as a shepherd is not complete without his sheep. So the head, Jesus, finds full expression through his body, through me, and through you as we submit to his direction, his authority, and his guidance. The church is important to Christ. He fills the church. The church could never be what Christ desires without Christ's filling. Paul says, in him, you have been made complete. And Jesus wants to fill us with his power. He wants to lay hold of us to lay hold of the hope of the gospel to which we were called. He wants us to recognize the glorious inheritance that we have in, in him and the richness of belonging to God and possessing all that is his. There's no reason for a child of God to be living a frustrated, defeated, meaningless existence because the same spirit that raised Jesus will also give life to our mortal bodies. And he does it every day, in every way. If you're here this morning and you're not in Christ, you have, as Paul said, no hope and you're without God in this world and his power in your life. True hope is found only in him. I've found that life is tragic for those people who have plenty to live on, but nothing to live for. And Jesus gives us a purpose. Jesus guides us, directs us, and gives us a purpose for living. God wants to deliver us from despair and give us hope through faith in Christ. You know, so many in our world have no hope. They have no peace. And when God offers us his peace, it's a peace that's far beyond human understanding. Take a look at the connection card and the the next steps that you may want to take based on what we've talked about today, what God has has spoken to our hearts. How about prayer? I will devote myself to prayer for others each day, specifically, faithfully, that they may be growing in Christ, experiencing his power, anchored in hope, and I will let them know I'm praying for them, what I'm praying for them. I'll, I'll let them know that it might be an encouragement and a help to them. Or second, I'm going to pray for myself, that I'll, I'll, I'll be continually filled with the Spirit, that I might know the hope of His calling and the amazing richness of being a child of the King and experience the fullness of His resurrection power in my life each day. You know, when we realize this, we should be done with low living and, and uh, you know, with, with just humanness because we are partakers of the divine nature. Or maybe this is something that would help you. You want to make a commitment? Take some time this week to just meditate really on this whole first chapter of Ephesians. What God has given you, who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and then ask God to enlighten your eyes, the eyes of your heart, and maybe journal your thoughts about how that looks in your life and what God wants to do to bring you more and more into his likeness. Father, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy, 
for receiving us as your children. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for all that we have in Christ, for your spirit who indwells us, for your power that is in us, for the forgiveness of our past, for the empowerment of our present, and for the hope that we have for our future. In Jesus' name, amen. Fill those cards out, pass those to the worship hosts as they come, and collect.